if we can look at the structure of the human brain, there is some uh, purely physical evidence of what I'm suggesting here. One of the most, I suppose, dramatic expressions of this came to us from uh, John McLean about three or four decades ago, who proposed the human brain is a triune organism. Now, it's not as simple as this, but in general, his thesis has proved to be quite robust to tests. And what we can argue from this thesis is that there are three large subcomponents of the brain, each with its own kind of intelligence. The reptilian brain stem at the very bottom here is the old brain. Now keep in mind that human beings are a species of vertebrate organism uh, that shares in its personal development in our ontogeny, the same kinds of transition states as do other organisms that are vertebrate animals. And as the human organism evolved over time, we obviously had to start from where we were. So at one point when we were much closer to reptiles, the brain basically had that structure. When mammals evolved, they added to that structure. They didn't abandon the instinctive centers of the brain. The, down here is where all the automatic functions take place. You're not conscious of having to breathe. You don't control your heart rate. It's all taken care of for you automatically down there, as it is in other much more primitive organisms. So as mammals evolved, they acquired this middle brain where our limbic system resides. And this is the seat of our emotions and our uh, affection for one another. The, the feelings, responses to food, sex, and so on and so forth come from that part of the brain. Humans have added, more than any other organism, something called the neocortex, the third great layer, as it were. And this is the seat of our intelligence, our capacity for forward planning, our capacity for compassion, uh, our, the, the thought centers, the language centers, and all of those so-called higher functions that we exhibit to a much greater extent than any other organism. So in many respects, humans have three brains, all operating at the same time, each influencing the other in a very tightly integrated way uh, so that at any point in time you may not even be conscious of which part of that brain is actually in control of your actions. There isn't a person in this room who hasn't given in to some emotion and then resented it or regretted it afterwards. There isn't anyone in this room who hasn't done something a shame hole that comes from the reptilian brain stem that they regretted afterwards. And there isn't anyone in this room who hasn't at some point made an intelligent decision to override some less, let's say, let's say more primitive urge and uh, therefore shown that we are capable on rare occasions of allowing our intelligence to override some of these other uh, more instinctive or emotional kinds of responses. So the point is, it's a big mixed up package and uh, we're perhaps in transition toward the upper end of the spectrum, but we ain't there yet in its entirety. So there's tension in this integrated mind. We think we are uniquely self-conscious and rational. So we live in that cerebrum. But there are circumstances in which reason predominates and other circumstances in which it is, does not. And I'm going to argue that reason dominates in relatively trivial, trivial circumstances or unimportant ones. Okay? When your safety or your survival is at stake, when your socioeconomic status is at stake, when your political position is at stake, you will fight to conserve and retain your prestige, your wealth, your power, and you're not often and or even usually acting out of intelligence. It's much more instinctive or emotional at that level. So what I'm arguing is then that under these circumstances, innate behavioral propensities that operate beneath consciousness in the midbrain and reptilian brainstem will override your rational behavior. Passion and instinct will trump reason in many, many circumstances in both ordinary people's lives and certainly in the political arena. We see it daily on the news. It's not as if this is news. It, it, I, I put it in kind of a modern context. If there's anything to, if not literally the, the triune brain and this mixed brain model, and then, you know, going back hundreds of years, the philosopher Mirandola recognized in human behaviors exactly the kinds of tensions that I've been uh, talking about.
talking about. This is the Renaissance philosopher. Uh, man was created by nature in such a way that nature, or rather that reason might dominate the senses. And by its law, the law of reason, all rage and desire of passion and lust might be restrained. So there's that tension again between the reasonable, rational man having to control the more instinctive and uh, passionate aspects of the character. And in fact, some would argue that God was invented as a kind of threat to make sure that we did this. So he he goes on to say, but when the image of God has been forgotten, we begin to serve the beasts within us. Uh, so again, it, it's this notion that we are this compound individual, that this uh, individual intention, and we create social constructs such as our religions to help reinforce the kinds of behaviors necessary for civilized existence to take place. Now Antonio Damasio, the second quote, is one of the most well-known neuroscientists uh, today, it studies the brain, brain function, the functions of the nervous system, and he's saying exactly the same thing, but in modern language. There are potions in our own bodies and our brains. The brain is a gland that generates hormones. It's the hormones that stimulate the kinds of behaviors that I was talking about a moment ago. So there are potions in our bodies and brains capable of forcing on us behaviors that we may or may not be able to suppress by strong resolution. So again, you've all been in situations where you know you shouldn't do that, but you go right ahead and do it anyway, because in that case you weren't able to suppress that strong emotion uh, by acting rationally. Mirandola and Damasio, although they were 500 years apart, are really tapping into the same sensibilities about the nature of the human organism. Okay. This is the best cartoon I've ever seen in my life. I wish I could uh, credit the, uh, uh, I don't know, Makoff, I guess. I'm not sure where it appeared. But here it is. Th this is our modern world. And it's, it's every morning I think of this cartoon when I read the paper. Because the first section will be full of the latest, uh, you know, climate event or catastrophic collapse of this or the soils are eroding there or something that, that, and so on. But on the business pages, there's not a hint that they're even in the same planet, right? So here we have a Chamber of Commerce meeting in which the guest speaker has uh, obviously been reading both parts of the paper. He doesn't want to disappoint anyone, however he said. And so while the end of the world scenario is rife with unimaginable horror, we believe that the pre-end period is filled with unprecedented opportunities for profit. <laughs> now, the whole of the greening of business, in my view, uh, fits nicely into this particular a characterization. When we look at many so-called green enterprises, they're nothing of the kind. It's, it's a kind of a green wash over what they were doing anyway. To and, and I've been in a number of meetings where I've heard senior executives say, of course we're interested in sustainability. And so we're becoming, we're greening our company. But as soon as it starts to negatively affect the bottom line, we're out of here. That's a direct quote from a senior executive in a corporate entity right here in Vancouver. So this is not far removed from the kind of truth again uh, that I'm, I'm trying to get us toward. So the private sector is responding to the profit potential in the massive trade in carbon credits, for example. If you think about uh, what has been the principal response of nations to the rapid melting of floating ice in the high Arctic? to move in and claim territory to get at the oil that's causing the problem in the first place. So it doesn't matter where you look, you see these tensions and these manifestations of this uh, conflicting uh, neurological disorder that we have emerging. 